Well, good morning, everybody, and um, welcome to um, yet another Zoom SPNP meeting. I don't know about you lot, but I'm getting really sick of this, but <laughs> we shall soldier, soldier on and do the best with what we've got. So um, this morning, um, obviously, welcome everybody, um, elected members, staff, um, visitors, and um, guests and viewers, obviously, because we have a few of them, as I've said before. Um, as Kieran said before, we're hoping to wind up or finish up today about 2.30 or so. We've got um, a meeting which should um, conclude about mid-morning and then five workshops afterwards. So um, without further ado, let's launch into it. Apologies. Um, I did have an apology for uh, Hazel for lateness, but she didn't um, decide to be late after all. Morning, Hazel. Um, and then I do have an apology there for Mariata. So if I could have somebody... I'll move. Okay, Roger's moved. Clear second. All, the, all those in favour say aye. Aye. Yes, carried. Uh, moving then on to disclosure of members' interests. Do I have anybody disclosing? In terms of the meeting today, I'm not convinced that there's anybody there with a, a disclosure of interest, but there may well be for the workshop. So we'll address those as we as we get there. Okay, moving on then to late items. I'm not aware of there being any today. So that takes us then to the confirmation of the order of meeting. Again, not um, aware of there being any need for a change. It's pretty straightforward. Maybe somebody's happy to move that for me. Um, Andrew and seconded clear. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Against. Carried. So then we move into the confirmation of our minutes. Uh, Hearing, uh, first starting on page seven. So we'll just flick through those, page seven and eight, page nine and 10. I've picked up a typo there, which I've let Sally know about for Councillor Gord on <laughs> item number eight. <laughs> um, page 11 and 12. On Susan, just on, yeah. Um, yeah, on page 11, that's the um, point number 10, the submission on the proposed changes to wetlands. Yes. Yeah, in the first paragraph in the third line, it talks about the Ministry of Environments, but it's actually Ministry for the Environment. Okay, yeah, and no, I see that. We can change that. That would be helpful. We can do that. that. Fantastic, thank you. Thanks, Claire. Um, page 12 and 13 is the final page. So can I have somebody who's happy to move that's true and correct record of that meeting? Bruce and seconded Mike, all those in favour say aye. 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 Against, carried. Wonderful. Uh, so our first substantive item for today is our quarterly district growth report, which notwithstanding the fact that we've all been locked up for a large amount of it, it seems to be wildly busy. So um, this morning, I believe we have Carl, Tony and Kirsty and even Wayne. So uh, Wayne, are you going to lead this in for us? I am indeed. Uh, good morning, uh, Madam Chair. Hopefully everybody can he hear me. And yes, good morning can. to your worship and uh, councillors. <clears throat> I've only, we've only got 15 minutes for this item. And um, so we're going to whip through the report pretty quickly. Uh, Kirsty and I will, will do that. And then uh, we want to spend a bit of time in relation to the resource management, enabling housing supply and other matters amendment bill. And we've got David uh, Topman online as well in respond, regard to that. So, um, so just commencing through the report, a very comprehensive report that's been put together by the team. Um, it is the uh, presentation to you for that um, quarterly report, and it involves the first quarter of the 21-22 financial year. It involves the period of 1 July through to 30 September. So the purpose of the report is to provide the committee with the quarterly update on the matters relating to growth in, uh, in the Waipa district, and includes matters arising at a national, regional, and at the district level. Um, there are a number of appendices, as you can see in the executive summary, that are attached um, to the report and is set out. Uh, and say, so most importantly, I want to spend a bit of time at the end um, of this presentation going through um, Appendix 10. Um, before we do, um, do that, we'll just highlight some of the key aspects uh, within the quarterly report. Otherwise, we'll take the report as read. So first up, um, if Kirsty can just take us through the highlights in relation to sections three, four, and five, that concerns national, regional, and district level matters. Thank you. 
And Madam Chair, Councillors Tenokoto Katoa, um, as Wayne's mentioned, um, take the report as read. So there are just a couple of things I'd like to highlight um, in relation to the national um, legislation section. It refers to three submissions having been made. There was a fourth one, and that is the, the one that Claire referred to um, with regard to the minutes, the changes to wetlands regulations that elected members did have an opportunity to provide feedback on. Um, Wayne has mentioned the RMA enabling housing supply bill that we'll talk to um, at the conclusion of this matter. Um, that submission closes on the 16th of November. And there is also another item, which is the MFE discussion document on the draft emissions reduction plan. Those submissions close on the 24th of November and we'll be looking to engage with you through the service delivery committee meeting on the um, 20, uh, 16th of November, sorry. Just moving now into regional matters, there is reference there to the draft future-proof strategy that we have had input into at a technical staff level, um, chief executives, and also through our representation on FPIC. Um, we have shared this with you and there was an opportunity for feedback. Um, just to provide an update that the consultation period closes on the 12th of November and hearings have been scheduled for the week commencing the 8th of December. Mayor Jim will represent WIPA on the hearings panel. Just moving to items at a district level, um, great that we have had council approve the Nahanapodi Village Concept Plan and Kihikihi UDP. Now our focus becomes the development of the Waipa Community Spatial Plan. So we are reporting to you on that um, on a weekly basis through the Friday mail out. We are also engaging with you um, through monthly strategic planning and policy committee meetings, whether that be formal or informal reporting. And there is a workshop later today um, to provide you with an update. We look forward to sharing with you where we're at on that. Um, so now I'd just like to hand back to Wayne. Thank you. Well, thanks for that, Kirsty. I'm going to just speed up a little bit. So um, onto section six. So we're onto the e-plan. So plan, the e-plan continues and makes good steady progress. We'll be doing demonstrations on the e-plan to managers and to the council, hopefully in November and December. Potential go live for the date is now in um, likely December or in the new year. The plan change program um, is detailed there for you. You receive separate reports in regard to the plan change. Importantly, we'll be workshopping with you the issues and options papers on the PC21, the MPS Urban Development for Infill Subdivision. It covers urban design issues, affordable housing, details on future land, tenure of growth sales, and you know, focusing on things like T6 and the St Ledger Road area as well. We want to have another look at that, um, residential versus uh, large lot and the efficiencies of development. We do have a number of appeals in relation to PC13. There was three that are last count, and so we're just compiling that. Um, the appeals closed, um, closed yesterday. Uh, we'll come back to you on that. Um, recently heard application, so we've just dealt um, provide information there relating to the Hodges and Festival One, so both decisions are out. The later, um, there's been no appeals. The former is still in the appeal period. Um, the consent summary I'll just take as read, which is um, resource consents, the LIMS information. Uh, key approvals, so um, one of the key approvals um, that you're aware of is, of course, the C2 uh, growth sill, 3Ms, and um, there was a significant um, uh, development um, on the western side of, of Cambridge. It's a major subdivision activating the C2 growth sill. It's going to provide for uh, um, development of 30% of that um, growth sill, 47 hectares. Um, it's a resource consents now being approved with conditions. It will provide for 212 residential lots, one lot for a primary school. It's already been designated by the Ministry of Education. Uh, super lot for retirement village, a neighbourhood commercial lot and associated reserves and we're developing the, um, the, the neighbourhood park in conjunction with the, with the developer, uh, utility lots and, and roads to vest. So that is a significant and important growth still for Cambridge and unlock, will unlock more, more housing and more public and community facilities which the town urgently needs. Um, so just moving on. Um, We've also detailed um, developments that are going on around the district in the C4 area. There's 64 lots being approved, uh, high density areas, Cambridge North. Uh, we continue to um, get the key infrastructure such as stormwater swales to allow for more development. And in the report, you can see uh, further approvals for compact housing, 
30 lots and a 52 lot application as well. Um, and of course, we've got the Somerset Retirement Village and the medical centres. So a lot going on in, in, in the Cambridge North area. And um, Te Aumuru is um, the same. Um, we've detailed in the report, the growth cells, um, what's happening in the T1, and T2 growth cells. Um, is, so I won't go through them in, in, in any great detail. Um, press, press for time at the moment. Uh, the next uh, section is the building consent uh, information. Again, I'll take that as read. We've had 536 building consents submitted in the quarter, up 44, the same period in 2020, and uh, Appendix 2 and 3 um, highlight um, the, the figures relating to new dwellings and building consent applications received in a monthly comparison with the previous uh, year. Uh, the, the final sections are monitoring and enforcement animal control environmental health. A um, lot of information there, and I'll just take as read. Uh, the, the, the next section I just want to um, get some comment um, on is relating to what I indicated was Appendix 10, um, which is the Resource Management Enabling Housing Supply and Other Matters Amendment Bill. <clears throat> so this is a really important um, bill for, for WIPA, and um, we're, we're interested in receiving um, your initial feedback. The bill was announced by government on the 19th of October. There's been no prior consultation that's been lodged. Uh, or undertaken with um, local government in relation, relation to this bill. Uh, introduces new changes to the RMA. It's a fast track bill. Um, they want legislation in before or before Christmas. Uh, it's intended to bring forward and strengthen the NPS urban development provisions, which WIPA must comply with as a tier one high growth council. The bill mandates, and I say that mandates, medium density for almost all our residential areas. Uh, that includes the cities, um, and it seems to be focused on the cities about Auckland, Hamilton, and for Hamilton, it does include Waipa and Waikato District, Tauranga, Wellington, and Christchurch. Um, but it doesn't include large lots, so we're only, only talking about our residential zones here. So the intention of this bill is to rapidly accelerate the supply of housing, where the demand for housing and, and is high. It helps address issues of housing choice and affordability. <clears throat> Importantly, it permits um, without land use consent, without resource consent, at least three dwellings of up to three storeys high. Um, it mandates um, the various bulk and location requirements. And um, what you'll find is um, height requirements uh, will increase under this bill as a permitted activity up to uh, 11 metres plus another metre for a quality pitched, qualifying pitched roof. So you can have 12 metre high buildings. Uh, the road setbacks are only 2.5 minimum, side yards one metre minimums, the site coverage is 50% maximums, impermeable service 60% maximums, and the height in relation to boundary, um, a lot more permissive, you're looking at a 60 degree recession plane from six, six metres above ground level, that's compared to what we have now, which is probably more in the 45 degrees or 28 degrees, um, depending on the sun angles and 2.7 meters above boundary. So a lot more denser, a lot more closer, um, a, lot, a lot more um, higher than what we have and um, the possibility and also reduced outdoor living areas. Um, there's no minimum lots for subdivision, no minimum lot sizes for subdivision. Subdivision still will be required. Um, so that's sort of the nub of what the bill is driving at. Um, we must undertake, so this again is a mandate on us to undertake a plan change to introduce these medium density residential standards, um, including any changes to our financial contributions to cover the cost of infrastructure upgrades. We must notify that by uh, the 20th of August next year, that plan change, if the bill is, um, uh, proceeds into legislation this year. Um, so we've got to prepare that plan change, we do the public notice, we go out and do the, the submissions and further submissions, we must appoint an independent hearing panel um, to make the recommendations uh, to, to yourselves as council, and then you either accept or reject the, the recommendations, if you reject it, and then goes to the minister um, for consideration to make the final decision. There are no appeal processes in this um, streamlined, expeditious planning process that they've set up. Has implications for WIPA, and this is, I guess, where, where we're looking for some feedback, and particularly for, for David, who's pulling together a submission. Um, is it affect, will it affect our urban character um, with these smaller outdoor living areas at these height relation to boundary requirements, these higher buildings that we've got? Um, 
the, the opportunity to develop these anywhere in our residential zone. So not in where we've defined where these cluster areas or high, medium high density areas should go. Um, will it create good urban design outcomes or poor urban design outcomes um, if we don't have an urban design lens over this? Um, so, and yeah, what will be impact on our infrastructure? So. Um, if we do have areas that have higher density and we don't have stormwater infrastructure, what is the impact on that? So, so there's a lot to think about. And uh, we're unfortunately, because of the speed of this bill, we've got to get the submissions in on the 16th of November. So we've set up a staff working group. To, um, it's convened to compile, comp compile and um, draft a submission uh, on your behalf. And um, your feedback is welcome now uh, on this. And so. I guess, is it something we want to be part of in terms of this bill, or should we try and opt out? If we, if we opt in, um, is there any particular provisions or safeguards that you would like us to capture in this bill? And once we uh, hear your feedback, then um, we'll obviously circulate the submission, which has got to be um, drafted. David, um, do you want to make any observations, uh, quick observations, what I've said, indicated? Uh, only um, morning, Maureen, or... Um, only that, um, in, in addition to what Wayne said, in terms of fast tracking, it's required to be notified next year, the plan change, and it would be operative the year after. So it's a very fast turnaround, even as a RMA process to bring it into effect. And what they're talking about is the NPS urban development, the national policy statement came into effect in 2024. This is bringing it forward by a year and it's spreading that medium density everywhere within those tier one urban environments. And I think the challenge for us is, are we a tier one urban environment in the, in the first instance? Because it's clearly targeting cities and we're not a city. Um, that would be uh, a position, but clearly as it's written, the bill says Waipa and Waikato district are part of the Hamilton tier one urban environment. Through you, Madam Chair, I just wonder if we can just provide clarification that um, David will circulate to elected members this Friday through the Friday mail out um, a draft submission. Um, there is also a meeting of chief executives of Future Proof Partners this Thursday afternoon, and the purpose of that meeting is to try and ensure that there is some alignment as between Hamilton City Council, Waikato District Council and Waipa. Thank you. Thanks, Kirsty. Uh, look, look, lots of feedback, I'm sure. Well, how about we go uh, Claire, Roger, Jim, and then Marcus. Yeah, thanks um, very much. Um, yeah, I was a bit um, shocked to see this um, passed or yeah, proposed as without any consultation with local government. Like I thought that any legislation that central government does, isn't there some sort of step where they had to say, how does this affect local government and do an assessment on that? And it looks like they've skipped that step because um, I understand from what Gary circulated on Friday that actually using brownfield um, sort of intensification for, um, for, for housing is actually more expensive and puts a lot of pressure both on our existing infrastructure and on how we can manage stormwater adequately generally. Um, so if we were able to opt out at the time being, I'd I think that would be great because the feedback I get from my community sitting on the resource consent um, hearings panels is that they want to retain the look and feel, the character of their um, urban areas and to um, open the door to this kind of intensification, higher density of housing is, is, is really going to remove any controls that we have over that. I mean, I note that the purpose of it is to allow councils or require them to better plan for growth. But that planning process doesn't simply mean allowing more housing. It means there's a lot of other things that we need to plan when we're, because we're talking about communities. Yeah, so, so we do need to plan other things apart from how um, dense we'll, we'll um, allow housing. Um, I was also questioning whether or not allowing three stories um, is also going to be suitable for WIPA, um, given that um, 
my understanding is that it's more expensive to build um, above two stories anyway. So I, I think affordability is, is probably as important as um, the um, capacity for housing. And I understand too that we do have an adequate supply of in our growth cells for sections. So in fact, um, yeah, it could be argued that we've got those issues covered already and we don't need to be part of this particular amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Um, yeah, I think you'd probably find a few people around our table who probably agree with you. Roger. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, uh, first of all, a, a question, if I could, Wayne. Um, this suggestion or this uh, proposal, is this both greenfield and brownfield development? Uh, well, well, that's, my, nodding, that's, so it is. that's my understanding, yeah. yes. Yeah. So that would mean that if we had uh, somebody in an established um, suburb where there's a, a purchase of a property, that property would be knocked down and then totally in, in contrary to what the local amenity is, somebody could stick up three units of three stories high that sticks out like a sore thumb in that particular uh, suburb. And that doesn't make sense to me. Um, I think when you look at a couple of things, if the future proof goes through, they've already designated in that future proof that any greenfield development in Cambridge has got to increase its proposed density from 12 and a half to 17 per hectare up to 20 to 25 per hectare. So we've already got a provision within future proof because that would have to come down to our district plan. And if that occurred, then that would at least be a planned development within a, a development concept plan, which would mean that the infrastructure would be um, well planned for that new subdivision. Having this idea where somebody can come along and just to build a three by three uh, unit development anywhere just doesn't seem to make sense. It's contrary, it's contrary to good planning rather than enabling good planning. I think we're also seeing that in some of the developments and particularly C4 is a great example where in there they've got 64 uh, low density units, but an extra 36 high density units. So that higher density is occurring under our current district plan anyway. So I don't see the need to have this, what to my mind is a bit of uncontrolled uh, higher density planning occurring. So I would be, uh, I'd be against that, uh, against that concept. Yeah, thanks for your uh, thoughts there, Roger. Um, Jim, then Marcus. Yes, thanks, Madam Chair. Look, I, I think this is <coughs> another knee-jerk reaction by central government that hasn't thought the, uh, the problems through. And look, we all appreciate that, that we need higher density um, uh, developments, but in the, in the most appropriate place. So look, I agree with Claire and Roger's comments. Um, and in terms of spoiling our existing amenity values within our residential areas, this is almost guaranteed to do that. I don't know how we would ever um, cost what our financial contributions are because we would never know um, what percentage, I suppose, of our existing residential areas were, were going to take up the uh, opportunity to develop uh, uh, another two houses on every section. So effectively, potentially tripling the, the density and how that would relate to our existing infrastructure, not only the pipes and, and the roading, but also the amenity in terms of parks and reserves and play areas and, and open areas. So I think it's a, a recipe for creating really slum situations um, and 
a huge additional cost on existing uh, ratepayers to retrofit um, stormwater, sewerage and, and, and water pipes. So I think it's totally inappropriate um, whether we can get out of it just simply by uh, getting WIPA out of the, uh, uh, the proposed uh, reform in terms of the uh, national uh, policy statement or not, I don't know. But if we are still rolled into it, then I think we should be ob objecting strenuously um, to it. And it's almost a case where uh, if you object, if you're a neighbour to all of a sudden being overshadowed, you're accused of a NIMBY and not in my backyard. We all appreciate that we need uh, additional density, but the moment it goes next door to me, we don't want it. But for whatever reason, council have established well thought out plans that we've consulted, we, we've got community support, and the community that have bought into that for the last whatever generations it is, um, should get council support to protect their investment. Um, it's not only the, the additional new uh, houses that we need to be built, but the community have, um, um, I suppose, trusted councils to uh, enforce our existing standards to protect their um, position, I suppose, in, in the in, uh, residential sense. And we have an obligation to look after their interests. And I think that we really need to push back strongly on this um, because it's uncontrolled growth that's going to really impact on our existing uh, ratepayers. So on the one hand, we need to uh, demonstrate that we've made provision for medium to high density, but we need to say that it's not appropriate in uh, established residential areas uh, where we want to maintain um, our standard of living that the community has funded over many generations. Agreed, Jim. Yeah, totally agreed, Jim. Um, Marcus, and then you, Graham. Thank you. Yeah, well, um, yeah, everyone said what I wanted to say, basically. So, yeah, I support everybody else's comments on that. Yeah. Yeah, Madam Chair, just wanted to say, backing up, Jim, um, we must have a facility there for the developer to pay some DCs because water, sewerage, and stormwater, if there are any upgrades needed for that particular street, then they must fall back to the developer and they must not fall back to the current ratepayers. Otherwise, the property developers will simply put that money in their pocket and we'll be, we'll be having to make sure all that comes and goes in that particular area. Thanks, Graham. Does anybody else have any? Uh, Roger and then Andrew. Yeah, just a question of, of Wayne and, and David. Um, as this proposal has got... Uh, uh, both party support in being put forward, is this likely to be another three waters situation where they just bulldoze it through without any yep. regard to uh, community consultation? Yep. Was that a definite yes from both <laughs> people? Look, um, that's sort of a, like a political question. I, I can't sort of respond on, on that one. Um, <laughs> Roger. We'll do it for you, Wayne. <laughs> Roger, if I could just comment, I think it absolutely is another three water situation where it's just getting bulldozed through. And as you say, on this particular one, um, it's got cross-party cross support. And in my view, it's another one where the community has got to push back and we need to support the community in pushing back and saying, this is not appropriate and let the let the politicians know that it's it's um, it's contrary to, to the views of the majority of the population. So um, it's absolutely another three waters in my view. Could I ask you another question, Jim? Where's democracy gone? <laughs> What's that? Get a photo. <laughs> All right. Like, um, museums will be open tomorrow. You can go and see what it used to look like. Um, <laughs> Andrew and then Claire. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, you know, as far as democracy goes, our system being um, at the moment effectively a first past the post job, we voted them in. There's the democracy, and they're doing what they want. 
Um, I totally agree with everything Jim said, and I just this is outside where I'm got any real expertise, but um, I, I tend to agree this is going to get pushed through. And I think Graham's comment, um, I'm sure staff have already more than picked up on that, but those are the kind of things that we have to be really on top of. Otherwise, um, uh, this is our this is going to be our one chance to um, to, to make some difference. So yeah. I'll be interested to look at the submission, draft submission, David, when it comes here. Thanks. So, Andrew, and look, I, I agree with you. Um, government can do what they, they want. And I would imagine that the costs of retrofitting our residential areas with the infrastructure that's necessary, and that's not just the, as talked about, the pipes and the roads, parking, provisions, all of those things. Now there won't be any room on private sections but it's all those amenity issues. But the moment we look at it, and if you take into account um, $100,000 uh, contribution um, for our new areas in terms of development contributions, it's getting up around that, that figure. It could easily be uh, that plus to retrofit brownfields uh, areas. So the moment councils try to defeat what the government is uh, attempting to do by charging what the true costs are, then an edict will come down from central government um, capping the amount that you can charge in development contributions. So um, you, we just need to be aware that, that, that uh, central government is riding roughshod over what communities want. Yeah, um, thanks, Jim. Yeah, look, thanks, Jim. I, I, I actually totally agree with you. And to me, um, this is another very ham fisted attempt to solve our housing crisis. Mm -hmm. It's not going to, um, because as Claire has already pointed out, it, this is not going to create affordable housing. Um, it, it's because it's going to be so expensive to. Um, at first initially buy a property to knock down then put three three-story houses up um, it's ridiculous um, no more ridiculous than uh, in instructing councils to um, create more land for development that was never going to create affordable housing either um, I, I would hope sincerely that this is a is a political idea rather than one that's come from people who are meant to know what they're doing, i.e. the, um, uh, the, the, the actual bureaucrats. Um, and in that, in that sense, I think this is quite different to the Three Waters. For me, it is uh, quite different. Um, it's going to get pushed through in the same way, but the idea has got far less merit in my view. Thanks, Andrew. Claire and uh, then Phil. And then Mike, did you have something you want to say as well? Okay, thanks a lot, Susan. Um, I just wanted to clarify, um, Wayne, you mentioned about um, a subdivision resource consent would be needed, but my initial reading of the bill when it was announced, I, I was under the impression that you could actually just go and put three houses up to three storeys tall on any section existing and apply for subdivision consent in the future sometime. So you don't actually need to have subdivision consent before you do this that that's i mean I, i'm hoping you might be able to clarify that perhaps i got that wrong uh i guess i made i made the point that there was no land use consent so we agreed on that point um but if there is a subdivision required they do need a subdivision consent but there are no minimum subdivision standards as i understand it david can correct me if i'm wrong that, correct Councillor Clear, that would be my reading of it too. Um, yeah, that it, it talks about no consent required in terms of the planning consent. It says you still need a building consent and it doesn't mention the subdivision. Yeah. So, so my, quite, quite my, right. Apply for my understanding consent. of that was that you could build uh, two, if you had, or, already had one house on a property, you could build two rentals and without any um, subdivision um, standards or consents, uh, if you wanted to sell one off in the future, then you would have to get a, a subdivision consent, almost like a cross lease, I would imagine. Um, but, and we know what problems that, that that has caused in the past. So 
you can build them as of right, but to get a new title, you'd have to go through a subdivision consent. That was mm -hmm. my reading of it. Yeah, well, that, that's good to have that clarified because I wonder whether or not we could cover that in the submission and just highlight, yeah, what, what problems that might create in the future. I don't know. Um, yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, Philip. Yeah, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, just briefly, I mean, um, some of our developers are already going to provide some options with uh, higher density um, residential properties with Kevin Honus, um, and he's indicated some of those properties will be worth around about 500,000. Um, they will be obviously smaller bedrooms with one or two bedrooms. And then where the new medical centre is going um, on Victoria Road that's started now, that's going to have a mixture of higher density and conventional, you know, townhouse, um, not townhouses, but uh, residential properties as well. So there is going to be a mixture anyway, which is great. Now, does anybody else have anything they wanted to add beyond, beyond the obvious um, opposition <laughs> expressed? Uh, Mike. Yeah, just um, through the chair, just that cross lease thing. Just be interested to see how that's actually going to work because a cross lease is if it's it can be divided or undivided. So there's a lot of cross lease sections, as we know, in the WIPA. And just how is that going to work with um, this sort of three story by three units? How I'm just good to get some clarity around that because there's a lot of properties that will be in that boat. Not, not here and now, but just to bring back. It has yeah. potential to create quite a problem, doesn't it? Mm. Wayne, mm. did you have something you wanted to? Oh, well, we'll have a look at that. But yeah, you know, land tenure can be a freehold um, unit title. Uh, cross leases, we don't get very many cross leases these days. Um, but unit title is a possibility if people do come back and try and retrofit a subdivision around an existing land use uh, activity that's occurred with. Um, through building consent. So certainly a point we'll have a look at. Yes, yeah, it's, it's more the point like Jim said, you've got an existing house, can you build, you know, in a normal section, you can build two more. Is it that across lease you can build four more or is it just two between the, you know, between the two cross leases if it's just between two? Yeah, yeah, you know, I can just be good to get some clarity. For you, Madam Chair, we'll look into that. Thanks, Councillor. Mm -hmm. mm. That feedback's been very useful, no, Madam Chair. Lou um, and then Hazel. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, Lou and then Hazel. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I'm absolutely in opposition to this, but I just wonder sometimes that this takes away all the planning, local planning and our input. And also remember that now we have the arbitrary amalgamation of our water services. Will we be able to get the infrastructure in place? Do we have any say over where the infrastructure is going to go? So this is going to make it very much more difficult. So I really feel strongly that this is just something of a political decision that's going to be impacting on us quite heavily because all of the development will be irrational. It won't be planned. It could be anywhere. So we have to try and formulate some sort of plan to counteract all of this within our towns, within our communities. It's going to make things very, very difficult. Thank you, Lou. Um, Hazel, then Roger. Well, um, Madam Chair, I'm really concerned with listening to the development of, of this, these conversations that health, the health and well-being is not taking into account anywhere along the way. And I've already had uh, the experience of living just next to a development where they, these houses were crowded in, there was no lawn space or very little lawn space. And it wasn't, it isn't, very occupiable by families and I've noticed that two families with children that bought in there have quickly sold and moved on again because this and so I just want to point out the dramatic effect that any crowding like this has on health and well-being thank you yeah, thank, thanks Hazel point well made Roger then Mike yeah, and it's another point of clarification here for, from Wayne and, and David. Um, and I hadn't thought about this, but if you had, you put, you say you've got an existing property and you build two, three story additional properties on that section, could you actually sublet 
each of those three to multiple tenants? I don't know if David's got an answer on that one, but I, I certainly would have to have a look at that um, question, um, Roger. It's, um, I don't think that's that the detail we know. Yeah. Yeah. Minefield. Yeah, um, I'd like to say that, Roger, I think if you could build a three-storey house uh, or dwelling, I mean, they could be three separate flats within that one building. Yeah, so I think you could have a massive explosion of people, yeah, that are actually living in, in a particular street. Yeah. It does talk about um, including townhouses, flats, apartments, smaller houses. So, yeah, you know, the possibility there, there is, Roger. Mm -hmm. Mike. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, just also in terms of legislation versus covenants, and, and I'm, I'm assuming legislation will trump it, but I'm just thinking of the good people in St Kilda say, um, and as time moves on, those big sections, how, how is that going to work? I think the you know, we need some clarity around that too. Like, you know, those people have spent a lot of money and, the, and, the, and they have got sections that can be subdivided. If there's no real minimum subdivision, people could just go and look at making some dollars, which is going to, you know, people have invested you know, well over a million dollars to buy into a place like that now. Um, so how do you think, I guess the question is, a covenant's going to be very secondary to the legislation, in, in term, particularly in terms of the brownfield, but also the greenfield going forward? Yeah, it's certainly a, a valid point, and I've, I've passed this piece of legislation on to some of the developers, our key developers, to have a look at as well. And um, at this stage, you know, they, they do rely on um, covenants, um, as a number of developers do. Um, I didn't see anything, but David can correct me if there's anything in this bill about covenants. It was a wider issue for the RMA um, um, review legislation, uh, maybe uh, dealt with under that uh, new piece of legislation rather than rather than this bill at this point in time. David, do you have any other comments? Yeah, through you, Madam Chair. Uh, thanks, Wayne. I think you've outlined it pretty well. That would be my understanding too, in that this, while this bill doesn't address it, the issue of covenants, it is something central government are very aware of and are wanting to address in terms of the reforms they have in mind. And yeah, they certainly want to get the covenants done away with. Uh, Madam Chair, I think we better wrap it up. I'm just conscious I've taken so much time and you've got a very busy agenda. Um, it was really an indication from the from the councillors um, about our perspective on the submission and you provided some um, some fantastic feedback for us to um, pull together the submission. Um, so we'll, we'll do that and we'll circulate it around. Um, the final matter is just that the report, um, the recommendation is a report to be received. So yeah, great. Now I think I think you've yeah, as you've said, you've probably heard us pretty loud and clear. I, I suspect that those um, that the proposal might work in some of the more um, built-up metropolitan areas um, in larger cities, but I don't think this is why far. I don't think this is the way people in Waipa want to live. So, yeah, thanks for that. Um, thanks for feedback. Um, do I have, I have a recommendation there appearing on page 15 um, to receive um, Wayne's report? I have somebody who's happy to move that for me, please. Lou's happy to move. And Mike will second. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Lovely. Thanks very much. And thank you very much, Wayne and team. So, then. The next matter is our Civil Defence Emergency Management Quarterly Report. And at one of yours again, Wayne and David Sines. Good morning, David. Good morning, Madam Chair, and uh, hello to everyone. Um, yes, so we're um, taking the report as read, but working through um, a few quick um, points here, sort of not wanting to labour the COVID f uh, fatigue that I think we're all suffering from, but there is a couple of things within that uh, that I will mention. Um, just on the reduction, Bit disappointing, but like many things, the Waikato Regional uh, Resilience Forum was scheduled to be. We were scheduled to host that, so that's a reasonably large forum. But um, uh, that was to be hosted at the Don Rollins. But hopefully, um, we'll be able to get that back in 2022. Um, under readiness, 
Um, again, um, our training and ongoing uh, face-to-face exercises, again, have to be postponed until, um, I guess, early 2022. Regionally, I guess it has made us look at um, online training and the ability to um, exercise and um, train more via um, um, digital or um, online face-to-face. So there's a, a project that's been worked through regionally um, and nationally, and we've been part of, of those workshops. So um, there should be some benefit um, out of that, again, which we've been push, pushing for anyway. Um, so that's quite a good thing. Again, under readiness. Um, so the WISPA um, project, so that's an ongoing development project uh, between Waipa, Otorohonga, Waitomu, and um, following a, a joint um, committee decision um, in September 2020 to implement this. I won't go through every bullet point there on page three of, um, I guess, the report, but essentially it's a system to send out uh, warning alert messages quickly. Um, it has predefined uh, message templates, dis- distribution lists, um, contact in groups, and um, it ha- also has an option to make voice calls to locations, individuals, <laughs> where cellular network may be low. So um, a great alerting system, it works in, um, I guess it is aligned to um, local council systems as well. So uh, we've involved um, local IT uh, and our comms teams within that. So essentially, yeah, as I said, a system to send out warning and alert messages very quickly once they come through. Um, ongoing work again with our community res- uh, response plans during that quarter, but um, again, um, obviously with COVID um, um, coming in, that was delayed. Um, in terms of response, um, Kathy Shaw and myself took part in, um, I guess, a national response um, um, surge, surge uh, effort of staff through to Westport. Um, as part of um, that severe weather emergency that they had through Buller and Marlborough. And so that was a couple of uh, weeks. So that was um, certainly helpful to them, but invaluable to us as well, um, to be working with um, people from all over the country um, and to, I guess, um, see that emergency unfold and how the response was managed. So um, excellent experience gained there. Um, alerts and warnings, we had our usual um, severe weather warnings where the uh, Regional Council flood room was activated and um, I guess um, we worked in with them, um, probably 23rd of September was the most severe that we had. We did have some um, surface flooding around uh, Wai Pass, certainly through Te Aumutu, um, as well with the Puniu River Alert um, reaching level one. Um, and then on to, I guess, COVID-19 Delta ver- uh, variant. So um, a lot of our work, obviously, since the 17th of August, when the country went into level four lockdown, um, has been supporting the um, health and MSD-led um, um, response to to the um, Delta variant. So um, as we've sort of mentioned before, a little bit different to the state of emergency COVID round one, uh, where civil defence led um, the emergency response very much um, on this occasion we've, we have been in support um, of the um, of health and MSD. And so that's been mainly through um, vaccination centres, um, identifying suitable locations and um, I guess the pop-up testing stations uh, where cases occur is making sure that they have um, logistical support, messaging, those sorts of things uh, where we can assist wherever we do um, alongside working within our comp with our comms teams um, making sure that the information is there for um, accurate messaging in support of vaccina- increased vaccination. Probably the only other thing on the horizon around that is um, is uh, probably the National Protection Plan, which we've seen some of that uh, with regard to the red light, uh, the red, green, uh, orange light, traffic light system the, the government's, uh, central government's released. Um, but clearly there's more of that um, of National Protection Plan to come late November, I understand, where there's probably li- likely to be uh, implications for local government, civil defence, um, 
involvement uh, within that plan. And a lot of that may centre around self-isolation and the support of those people uh, We, as, um, I guess, the res- ongoing response to to COVID and Delta uh, unfolds through the better part of this year and into 2022. Uh, recovery separate report will be presented uh, with regards to that. I think that f- um, follows uh, my report. So, yes, Madam Chair, I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dave. Obviously, some a number of these issues have been canvassed uh, both in the media and um, around our table in the past. So, have yes. there any uh, comments or questions for, um, for Dave in terms of his report? No? It's not like our group to be speechless. You floored them, Dave. That's good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, look, okay, on the basis that nobody has any comments or questions for for Dave, um, a recommendation there, which I'm happy to move from the Chair, that his report be uh, received. Graham will second that. So all those in favour say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Fantastic. You got off lightly there, Dave. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thanks very much for your work. Thanks. And that leads quite nicely, of course, into our next one, which is um, Gary Knighton and his COVID-19 recovery quarterly report. Morning, Gary. Uh, morning, Nakoto. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yes, so just uh, introducing this report. Clearly, it's, um, it's a different report to the last one we gave you um, back at the beginning of August um, as we find ourselves, you know, really out of recovery and, and back into a response phase. Um, so this probably this report will, probably, will re- reflect that um, to a certain, certain extent. Um, also just note that uh, with respect to the recovery fund, you have, we have a workshop uh, later on this afternoon, um, just in terms of getting some direction from you about uh, we want to head with that uh, remaining $258,000 in the recovery fund. Um, just to the report itself, just uh, firstly in the, in the social sphere, and I think, um, I think we're painting a picture that David alluded to around a, um, a quite a different recovery, or quite a different response to the 2020 uh, lockdowns uh, with um, health and uh, social welfare now sort of uh, leading the response. Um, and a number of, sort of uh, I guess, social and psychological effect, logical effects flow, following on from that. I think um, since the report was written, we've made a lot of progress, and particularly with the, the community advisors working with the district health board. And uh, I think we've got some good alignment there now and some... Uh, Working on, working on um, supporting them, particularly in the vaccination drive and uh, also uh, lining up uh, his worship with some of the uh, communication uh, that uh, appeared to be uh, sort of falling off. Uh, and uh, so that, that, that work will now sort of keep us well in, in the link with uh, the Area Health Board. Um, it's just uh, um, community librarians just uh, noted there as well. Uh, their work with uh, with lockdown has shifted more to an online support uh, basis. They're looking at some local history content for the website, um, and have been well, we're working with uh, rest homes around dementia uh, patients as well, um, and they have received some additional funding for teen and children's e-books. Um, with respect to the economic environment, um, and note that your next item, you've got a, uh, a report from Infometrics, basically from the dated October, um, which I guess looks at the impact of this lockdown on the white power economy. And just in short, um, I guess it's, it's suggesting they're, they're potentially an uneven bounce back primary and sec- construction sectors looking quite strong, although subject to the potential, some potential supply chain uh, issues there. However, uh, retail and hospitality and accommodation looking like being the hardest hit. Um, hopefully uh, yesterday's announcement will at least start to uh, 
open things up a little in that, in that regard. Um, you're yeah, looking to see how we can uh, support them. And uh, Steve Tripp's links organized some work with First Retail around the webinar um, and as a sort of first, first line of how we might support them. But uh, again, that might be a discussion you want to pick up on this afternoon in the workshop on the, the fund. So um, that's, that's the uh, report in a nutshell. Happy for any questions. Yeah, thanks, Gary. Um, obviously, that's um, it's been some pretty challenging times for a lot of people in our district on a lot of fronts. So any questions from um, um, Jim oh, and then Graham? Thank you. Yes, thanks, Madam Chair. Look, it appears that the best thing, and I know we're having the discussion later on this afternoon, but um, the the one group, I suppose, that have been identified that are really holding up the uh, the, the magic 90% vaccination rate are, are younger Maori. And somehow we've got to get um, and support um, the DHB and, and, our, um, <coughs> and our local mana whenua to actually get those younger Maori in and get vaccinated now. My understanding is hospital board are doing a huge amount, even one-on-one, -on -one, ringing people, trying to convince them to, to get vaccinated. I certainly haven't got the answers, but in terms of getting the economy opened up and people working again, um, the only way is to get that vaccination rate up. So we've really got to focus on, on those uh, areas where... Um, young Maori are not getting vaccinated. Now, how we convince them, I'm certainly not an expert, but any resources that we can put in to help the hospital board in that area, I think it's paramount, really, because um, it is um, it is a serious gap in the whole vaccination program. So, look, I'd, I'd really want to see um, if we can be doing anything to actually assist in that rate, um, the you know, mobile units going door to door effectively is what they're starting to talk about. And um, look, as, as annoying as that is, when you can see the benefit of, of vaccination, uh, if it's what's needed to be done, then we've just actually got to get stuck in and do it. So look, um, it's just really a plea if anybody's got any bright ideas on how we can motivate um, as I say, the younger Māori to get vaccinated, the better off we're going to be. Um, can I respond to that, Madam Chair, to Jim through that? Now, this morning, John Tamahiri announced on the news that they have finally taken, they've got access to um, details of, of, of Māori who haven't um, been vaccinated. And I think that we should be, I, I, I think what's happened is that we, we, it's the wrong people that are going after um, supporting our Maori community, and I'd like to see what his plan is, and and that we join in with because Maori aren't just ignoring all of this. They that, but they have got a plan together. They've now got the the information that they need to carry out this plan. Let's find out exactly what it is and how we can help them to actually bring that to fruition. And I would say that if that's got a lot to do with Māori looking after Māori in the way that's acceptable to those young people. So yes, I was really pleased to listen to John this morning, even though I was in a hurry to get ready for this meeting. So yes, thank you. Madam Chair, you, just, if I could just, just respond, um, just, just to reassure you that the community advisors are working with the DHB closely and looking to utilise their, their networks and um, our iwi relation advisor networks in terms of mana whenua as well. So, uh, but we are in a support role to the DHB. Um, we're not the, the principal provider of those services. So just, just to reinforce that. Yeah, th thanks, Gary. Graham, and then Liz. Yeah, thanks, Madam Chair. I just wonder whether the pressure will come on the people that have um, are not chosen to um, get vaccinated as they're going to have to show um, that they have done that to either a bar or a shop or a restaurant or a mall. And um, we've already had a situation where one of Jenny's groups, one of the girls was anti-vax and she's come back and says, well, you know, I'm going to have to do it because my clients don't want to see me. Um, the other interesting thing on the business news this morning, what 
New Zealand un unemployment at a 13 year low. So um, there's a real pressure on everybody um, in terms of um, getting staff and it's going to put pressure on, um, on wages as well, a bit of inflation. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Graham. Liz. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Uh, yeah, certainly um, very yeah, supportive of, of increasing vaccinations, obviously. But, hey, I just wanted to um, kind of get everyone's brains working for the discussion that we will have a little bit later um, around, um, you know, recovery. So what we know, of course, is the hospitality industry is probably one of the hardest hits. Um, but there's lots of overseas models and lots of overseas, um, you know, they're a year ahead of us. And, I think already we can see how they have managed to, um, I guess, pre-plan, but also how to get that, that industry back um, operating again really effectively. So um, I'm really looking forward to having a really innovative discussion. And um, I like the, you know, all the ideas we've seen overseas, you know, look to how we can actually plan in WIPA. So I'm talking about closing our roads. There's all sorts of um, really good ideas um, and, yeah, I just really want to start early. I want to engage with that hospitality industry nice and early too, Gary. Um, I was on a, on a Zoom call yesterday with um, Jason Dawson and a few others around the industry. And I think we need to gather them together. And I think we need to work and start planning now. We will, we will eventually be able to open. I, mean, I know that's not yet. There's no point really looking at, uh, you know, some of our event centres. We're, we're miles away from being able to open. We need level one. Um, but our, certainly our restaurants and our cafes, we can do a lot now, be really innovative about how we can get our CBDs um, at Cambridge and Tamworth operating really, hopefully really effectively. Yeah, thanks, Liz. Uh, Lou. Thank you, through you, Madam Chair. I, I agree totally with what Liz is saying, and everyone seems to forget that we have the hospitality industry is in dire straits, and we're not able to trade, we're not open to open, and we're finding it very, very difficult. There's some interesting uh, characteristics out there. You can't go and have a haircut, for example. Some of the laws and the regulations are quite impossible to operate with. Uh, the thing that I actually wonder when we've released the fact that we're going to have Auckland come down to level three, modal two, uh, I would suggest that we might see a modification at 90%. I can't see how we can possibly try and get all our DHPs to get to 90%. There are going to have to be some concessions. We've got a lot of disparate areas. We've got a lot of people living. Just look at the Waikato Hospital Board, how big the area that it actually encompasses. It's not just Tio and Waipa and Waikato, it goes right down. It's, it's a very big area, a lot of rural area in it, a lot of virtually extra areas. So we've got to consider, I think, that this is possibly an objective being set politically for a political reason. And I believe that most other countries have opened up 75 to 80 percent and operated effectively. How did their death yeah. rate go? Quite openly, not as bad as us. And actually, we, we, the death rates, we talk about death rates, but the death rates, have a look. Did you watch the cricket on on, on last the other night with um, the Black Caps? They had the whole stadium full. No oh, mark. yes. Mm. And, the, oh. and the All Blacks at Wales, stadium full. It'll be interesting to see the outcome from that. Roger, do you have a comment to make? Yeah, I mean, I'd just like to support what... Uh, what Lou said there, I think, um, unfortunately, we're going to see an increase in community cases, and those community cases are going to get to such a level that what's the point on keeping the border closed and not allowing, you know, people to come in if they're fully vaccinated? So I think we're getting closer to that point in time where they may have to seriously look at, say, making it 80%, 85%, and opening up the border, uh, because why control the border when you've got a lot of community cases rampant in in each area? Yeah, yeah. Look, I, I guess um, those are all decisions that are well above our pay grade. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, we, we could we could go on for quite some time. I'm sure we've all got you know pretty clear opinions on whether this is a what political stance um, uh, we have in, around the issue. So. Um, um, if anybody's got any other questions and uh, with specific reference to Gary's report as they relate to WIPA, then um, please let me know. Anybody have any other questions? 
No. I'm not just, I'm I'm just, just Philip. I'm, I was just quickly going to say what Roger just said. I mean, Australia opened up their international borders yesterday to to the to their fellow Australians coming in with double dose and and what have you. So yeah, yeah I'll formally we... move the acceptance, madam. Okay, thank you, Lou, for moving. Oh, um, Claire's happy to second. All those in favour, say aye. 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 Against. Carried. Thanks very much, Gary. And please pass on our um, gratitude to um, Gina and um, Corinne for all the fantastic work that they're doing uh, away in the background. It's it's not been an easy period of time, yep. and they're, they're really um, holding up really well. And, and Karen's played for Bipar brilliantly. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Right. So that brings us then on to um, the next item, which is the annual plan. Gosh, we're constantly it's in the cycle, aren't we? So. And let me have a look here. Who have we got here for this? Haven. Oh, look, there you are. Hi, Haven. How are you? I'm great. Great. That's good. So um, Haven's report starts on page 118. Take it away, Haven. Okay. Thank you, Chairperson O'Regan, and good morning, elected members. So, yeah, the purpose of this report is just to provide a quick quick update on the annual plan and particularly on those um, key economic, economic assumptions and how we're progressing the review of those. Um, you'll see that attached to the paper is the report from Brad Olson of Infometrics. So I'm not looking to speak to his report in detail because I can't do it the justice the way he does it with his engaging um, speaking that we we're all familiar with. Um, and we also got a brief update from Gary in the previous um, paper. Um, but essentially, the, it, the report notes that there's um, that doesn't trigger any change to the current assumption. There's still a lot of volatility and there will be subdued growth. We're expecting subdued growth for two years before a stronger rebound. Um, the other thing highlighted in my paper is the borrowing and interest rates. Um, we've received those from Bancorp. They're a little higher than in the LTP. So currently finance is working with those and looking, to, looking at how best to apply them to the draft budget. And then the report also mentions that we were waiting for the inflation rates from Boo. We've since got those. And again, finance has, has got those and looking at how to best uh, apply them to the draft budget as well. At the back of my report, I have included a bit of a, a project time frame out until June next year. The key things to focus on in the, until the end of the year are that we will be presenting impacts of a draft budget to exec actually on the 18th of November, and then workshopping that with elected members in early December. Then we'll come back to you again in middle of December with a formal report um, seeking a decision on how we progress with engagement. So yeah, there's just a quick rundown. Um, I think now it's probably best to open up to any discussion points councillors want to raise about Brad's report or any questions that you might have about the annual plan. Thanks, Haven. Um, it's good to have um, a really clear understanding of uh, the, the um, work plan ahead going forward. It's, it's good to get our heads around that. So, Claire, question. Um, yeah, thanks, Haven. Um, great to be um, having a look at, yeah, the annual plan that's coming up. And I really like the, the schedule that's, that's laid out. That looks really great. Um, I had a question about um, Infometrics um, report, actually, just that... Um, um, something that's been mentioned in the news media has been um, the number of businesses that are closing down. Yeah. And um, I, I just feel that that would be a relevant um, metric for us to, to be across um, because obviously we are looking at setting the level of rates and also um, concerned with the viability of our CBD businesses, I guess. Yeah. So I was a bit surprised that that wasn't sort of one of the um, aspects of the economy that Infometrics hadn't commented on so far. Yeah, and What's just... Hmm. Yeah, no, good point. I think I'll check in with Kirsty first, but I think we could potentially reach out and maybe get a little bit of an update from Brad or however the best way is to get that information um, and, and factor that in as well. Through you, Madam Chair, um, you would appreciate that Brad provided this update at the um, in the earlier stages of this current lockdown and restrictions. But look, we have um, advised you previously that we will be connecting with Brad um, to provide intermittent updates. So we will touch base with him and, and look to have that data included if we can in the next update to you. 
Absolutely. Oh, yeah, that's great. I mean, I guess, you know, whether or not there's certain types of businesses that are going under that that we should be concerned with, or if it's just general, um, yeah, I suppose the particular pockets that that are most, I suppose, just finding it not viable. Yeah. Yeah. Great. great. Okay. No, we'll follow up and look to have that to you as, as soon as we can. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Claire. Anybody else have any questions for either? Yeah, Madam Chair, can I just say, if you look at that report, WIPA is doing exceptionally well with WIPA sitting at 9.2% higher in spending than 2019 levels compared with a national average of 1.5. And I know that talking to my wife after the announcement yesterday, I think the leash is going to be off on the spending. So let's hope that continues and our local people actually get the chance to partake. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, how um, we've still managed to find ways to spend, hey, and, yeah. and quite quite um, significantly. But, I, I mean, I know for myself, we've been making decisions to try and spend local a lot more than we have in the past, even if it's costing a lot more. It can't, it's kind of a, a moral obligation, I think, that exists there to support <laughs> your own. So, um, yeah. So I'll be driving over to Villagrads to pick up wine rather than buy it from the supermarket and put it that way. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just interested on page 127, the first paragraph, that card spending is more than triple the Waikato regional growth um, average. Now, that's pretty phenomenal for Waikato Waik to be spending that much. I don't know whether we should keep you girls at home or not. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> I'll let that one slide. Oh. I'll withdraw it. <laughs> um, any other questions <laughs> that, are, that are a little less sexist from the from the uh, elected membership? <laughs> no. Hey, look, thank you, uh, Kirsten Haven. Um, yeah, interesting. I mean, yeah, we obviously are good spenders, and and we've got a couple of pretty strong um, industries underpinning us. But um, that's not to say that I think that there will be a lot of a lot of hurt out there, and particularly in the retail sector. I, I'm aware of businesses that are announcing closures. On a, on a daily basis now so um, let's hope that this um, tail isn't as long as what they're predicting and that we can actually start opening up and getting these businesses going again um, but yeah thank you for the for your report um, I have um, obviously a recommendation there to not only receive Haven's report but also to receive um, uh, Infometrics update can I have somebody move that for me Claire's mm -hmm. happy to move Bruce is happy to second all those in favour say aye Against, carried. Fantastic. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, team. So that takes us to our next item, which is the draft annual nuisance bylaw statement of proposal. And I believe this is yours, Graham. Good morning, Graham. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, everybody. Um, indeed, this is the proposed animal nuisance bylaw. It's the item is seeking the committee's approval on the form of the bylaw, the approval of the statement of proposal, which is attached, and the approval to consult. Um, if we have that approval, we're planning consultation from the 12th of November, that's a week on Friday, until the 13th of December. Um, we're anticipating having direct contact with known keepers of bees, pigs, and poultry. Uh, particularly in the urban areas and any specialist organizations and national bodies and of course any online information and using the local uh, uh, media and hopefully our comms team can create a bit of a buzz around this one so we get some uh, some feedback um, and obviously using an online submission form so um, thank you chair Uh, thanks, Graham. Lou, and then Claire. I'd very much like to support this motion. I think uh, it's well written, and uh, I think it just aligns us nicely with other councils around us, such as the Hamilton City Council. And I think that this just removes uh, from our agenda a law that we had about beehives. This is something I think that uh, we've been a long time process, but I would support it very much and congratulate Graham. So I'd happily move this motion. Yep, and I'd like to second it too. Please. Thanks, Lou. Um, thank you, Marcus. Now, Claire, before we put that motion, Claire, you had some comments to make, and then Graham. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank, 
Thanks, Graham. Yeah, you've done a lovely job. Um, so the question I had was really when you look at the purpose of the bylaw, um, it doesn't mention that it focuses only on animals in urban or residential areas. And so with our rural community, I thought, hey, man, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be really worried that they're going to get a lot of sort of um, eyes on them, you know, with um, creating nuisance maybe out in the rural zone. So I just thought right. it'd be quite good to have um, under that purpose to, to really highlight that it, it's just um, the keeping of those animals in the residential zone or um, urban, urban areas, something like that. Yeah, we can certainly look at that, Councillor, no problem yeah. at all. That's a really good point, Claire. I didn't catch that yeah. one. Yeah. It, yeah. It's, it's obviously yeah. there within the within the clauses, but obviously yes. the, uh, the yeah. purpose is purpose. a bit of a headline, isn't it? Yeah. 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 So, and, and that would be relevant for both the bylaw and the statement and proposal. Yeah. 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 Cool. Thanks. Thanks, Claire. Graham. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Graham, just on page 131, the first point about the distance hives can be from property boundaries, a uh, solid two metre fence. And I just wanted to point out the district plan only allows for a 1.8 metre fence. Um, indeed, we have been discussing that. Uh, that exact <laughs> point has been has been made. My understanding is that this is actually beekeeping best practice, and that the bylaw actually has different has provisions whether the fences 1.8 meters or more than two meters or or whatever so um it, the, there are either or provisions in there so mm -hmm. our feeling is that we're okay but one of the or but we're wanting to consult specifically with the apiculturists the professional uh, 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 national bodies. So um, we can get some more feedback on that. And if that needs to be amended through this, the submission process, then obviously we've got that opportunity. But we've, we were conscious of your point. Perhaps we, don't, we won't tell the bees. They might be a little bit, might have to get air masks to get over the top of that fence. Anymore. They <laughs> probably... <laughs> aren't aware of the 20 centimetre difference. No. <laughs> Thanks, Graham. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Weber. Any other questions for um, Graham in terms of this draft bylaw and proposal? No, no further questions. So subject to that small amendment that Claire has um, proposed, uh, we have um, there on pages 130, 131, three recommendations that we receive the report. Um, and that we note that it's uh, that the um, that the draft bylaw meets the requirements of section 155 of the local government act it's the most appropriate form of uh, bylaw and doesn't give rise to any of um, issues under the bill of rights and then the third thing is that we approve the actual draft animal nuisance bylaw and statement of draft proposal now Lou put that mark has seconded it all those in favor say aye, aye. against carried fantastic great Lovely. So, thank you very much thank you graham that brings our meeting uh, formally to a conclusion and i see according to our run sheet we are back um, and running again at um, 11 for our first workshop um, which is the waikato regional